please do ask um, any questions uh, that you have. So what we have is some materials uh, that kind of summarize, and we do get to NCTRC, um, that aspect. So I'll go ahead and give you those so I don't move around too often. Let's start taking pictures. So we'll jump in and look at some of this in a little bit. Um, the battle. And then I appreciate, too, that you uh, looked up some material. Uh, I was trying to get some quick stuff ready for you. Um, so let me just give you one more um, piece of information on myself. Um, as, as Sid said, we're, uh, we've been involved since um, the inception. And um, it was my advisor that told me to get involved and said, as a matter of fact, you will go to the conference. So I maybe was like you thinking, why do I have to do this? And had no clue when I became involved. And then uh, once we got involved, we saw why. So what happened, y'all, is that basically when we were starting to make some transitions and grow as a profession, I was a committee member. And I held then committee responsibilities and then chair responsibilities on both recreation and therapeutic recreation committees. So there were initially a lot of parallel things that were occurring and it was credentialing because we were trying to move the whole profession ahead. And there was no ATRA, it was just the National Recreation Park Association at the time that all this was occurring. So that's why there's obviously some date changes and why some of our initial involvement wasn't with ATRA because ATRA didn't exist. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you. Um, and, uh, getting involved does make a difference. <laughs> and it's a, it's a real privilege to meet people like, like the faculty that you have here. Um, and that's what happens when you, over the years, you get involved and stay involved. So I was just going to summarize um, today and have you ask me questions about um, the the credentialing pieces that we now have, where they came from, and some of the transitions that occurred as we developed them. Um, it, it was a, a challenging task, to say the least. <laughs> um, there were always differences of opinions, and um, one of the things that I'll say right now is, when somebody asks you to vote as a professional member or as an individual, please do. In the creation of NCTRC, for example, it took us three times sending the ballot out and then making personal phone calls to get the number of people we needed because we were making some, uh, creating an organization that had to be legally founded and we had to have um, an appropriate number of people respond to us. So I, I just can't say enough about staying, you know, engaged um, in your organization because um, those are the people that do make the decisions about our profession. So we'll start first with um, just a very quick overview um, of, of credentialing and uh, hopefully this is some material that is familiar to you. Um, it, the, the big focus now is a public safeguard. And we always were questioned, are you creating something that will assure you do no harm to the public? So that's been the foundation for all the credentials that have been created. And um, simultaneously, then you end up um, enhancing your own personal image as a professional. Many, many, many times, y'all, after we had our first exams in 1990, we would hear stories about people being on elevators and somebody, PT or OT or speech, would say, oh, you have to take a test now? And the same was true of recreation. So your credibility as an individual is vastly improved by, by having a profession in which we have credentials. Um, we, we nowadays, the buzzword is quality. Um, quality assurance, that's a term you're all familiar with, right? Quality improvement, quality assurance. Um, that's now associated with wearing a credential. They gave us these this year at the National Convention for CPRP. Um, and I left the first pin at the hotel, but the first pin for CPRP was designed by a group of students in a class I taught. And it had the three E's, and it was a triangular-shaped pin because the students felt, okay, we have to have education, etc. 
experience and an examination, then we're going to design a triangle. So the very first, this was this is brand new this year. The very first one that was designed was designed by students and represented um, those three pieces. Um, the, the the NCTRC pin has always been round. That was designed by another group of students who said, you know, if we're addressing the needs of the whole person, the circle is the best thing to represent. It. And then if we do have to work as a team of, indivi of individuals, the team collaborates, and that's best represented by something that's round. So that's the silent history of, of these pins <laughs> that came from you all um, as we were developing the organization. Um, it's also important, I think, to uh, realize that, and that was, it was a bitter pill to swallow for many people, that standards can be only minimal. It's minimal competence. And what happened initially, um, when we uh, had the first test in uh, 1990, both the CPRP and the NCTRC exam, was a lot of people, like myself, um, had to take the test. And so people came out of the test saying, oh, that was too easy. And we have to remind ourselves even now that the vast experiences that a program like this brings to you, that when you do take that test, it may appear easy because you've been exposed to so much and you have such good internship and practical experiences. Um, so that was offensive to some of the folks initially because they, they were administrators. Um, and that now has been the impetus to design some specialty examinations. So the pass rate initially, y'all, was like 95%. And people said, well, why are we having these tests at 95%? You know, look at PTOT speech and, and law and medicine. That's not the pass rate. And you guys tell me what's happened over the years then, after that first couple of tests. Did the pass rate go up or did it? Yeah, yeah. And so then what happens? What, what do you think happened, Mike, with that, when people saw that? <laughs> it's like, they started, well, I wouldn't say that they made it easier, but they kind of they gained uh, validity in the fact that the challenge has passed. Yeah. I mean, when you have all the professionals that have been doing, been in the field for 40 years, taking a certification exam, you know, your pass rate is going to be insane. The same, yeah, yeah, it was. And so we kind of had a double-edged sword for a while. People saying, oh, we're spending all this money, and First we had this high pass rate, and now it's dropping. Um, is this really appropriate? Is this what should be happening? And of course, it, it was. What what should should be happening? Um, I think most recently the pass rate is at about seventy to seventy-five percent. Mm -hmm. I want to say. Mm -hmm. And and literally, I was I just came here from being at Central Michigan, and those folks do two internships plus a field experience. So while I was there. They pulled their test scores out and looked. Well, guess where their students performed the best? Guess on what section of the test? What do you think? If you had two internships and one or two practical experiences. So they do a year of internships. Where do you think they would score highest? What would make sense? Clinical? Clinical and, and practice. I mean, they, their practice scores consistently are very, very high compared even internally to the, like the assessment piece or the professionalism piece. Very, very high. So practice is, is uh, very, very essential. And, and over the years, uh, we, we really want to identify the essential competencies that are minimally necessary to practice. And that, that as a result, has now generated development of specialty exams for or both recreation and recreation. So registration, you all probably have seen this definition. It's just a voluntary process and your name's on a piece of paper. Um, and initially there was no test. And um, professions now that have a test, like you, you see the OTR, so they take the test and then they create a registry and put their name on it. So they have both a registration 
of a name and a test. And we did create registries um, initially, because registries didn't exist. Um, usually, um, and, and initially, but now usually, continuing education is required um, with that. Now, to, to share with you um, just a piece of paper, because <laughs> it's got a name on it. This gentleman, um, you've heard the, uh, the assessment tool, the CERT, Comprehensive Evaluation of Therapy. Well, Bob Parker was one of the first persons that walked into a meeting, came through that door, and he was a little late, and he said, I get so tired of these professional development things, we have to do it in our hospital. Why aren't we doing it nationally? And this is way back, and there's a date on here since Dr. Sparsall, 64. This is his initial application for registration. Bob was the one that said to all of the profession, we need not only to upgrade our credential, but we need to stay upgraded. So the idea of continuing education or continuing professional development was introduced by a person that walked through the door that you now have some link to if you're familiar with the CERT because that's what they created in his hospital. Um, and, and you he, guys will get that in your assessment class that you're taking this semester. You'll, you'll cover the CERT. He, he uh, designed both a mental health CERT and a phys dis CERT. And, uh, at, after I met Bob at this meeting when we're sitting here checking people's registration applications, I said, well, can I come down and spend a summer with you? So I spent a summer with him and became familiar with how he developed both of the CERTs, and I observed all the professional development opportunities that they had and how they delivered him at lunch and at snack breaks, and then, then, then in those days it was the old, you know, the old eight tracks that folks would go into a lunchroom and spend 15 minutes listening to. Um, while they were eating at lunch. But that was the beginning of the idea of professional development in our, in our profession. That and was at what facility? He's at, in uh, uh, Greenville. I always get it mixed up. There's two Greenville's, right? North Carolina and South uh -huh. Carolina. Right. Yeah, and he, he uh, Marshall uh, I. Pickens Hospital. Okay. And I'll probably say the wrong state, but <laughs> I think we can look it up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it was South. Where is Eastern Carolina? That's East Carolina is in North, North Carolina. Carolina. Who is it, Marshall Pickens? Marshall I. Pickens. Uh, and I think that's South yeah. Carolina, isn't it? Okay. Greenville, South Carolina is near Clemson. South Carolina. South Carolina. Carolina. Yeah. Okay. That's, I knew I would say the wrong thing. But, and okay. it's, a, it's a very, very uh, strong facility, and, and um, that's where he did all the work to create those documents. Mm. Um, so so in, in the early beginnings, we didn't have a lot of continuing professional development. Uh, and I'm going to jump right now. So you all, for all organizations, registration is nationwide. Um, and, and it's just a, literally a, a name, your name on, on a registry. So kind of then taking us back to the history of moving forward towards certification. In 1953, um, <coughs> are familiar with the, the Council for Advancement of Hospital Recreation that came out of the three organizations in the human leader history. Um, and, and Bob was kind of the first generation out of that group of individuals. Um, he uh, was, was a member of a committee, a registration committee, that created and maintained some of the original standards. And so I met him because I got assigned, and you've heard this name, Dr. Carol Peterson. She was my instructor in Indiana. She was the one that said, you've got to go to a conference, you've got to get involved. So we met Bob. Um, we, were, we were sitting as a registration committee when he came in the door and said he was late because of having to go to these professional development pieces. Um, so Bob then was a member, as was I, of the Voluntary Registration Committee. That's where we started out. And we basically took the plan that the three organizations developed. It, they had three levels. So you can see where the emphasis was, historically. There, there wasn't 
even the word community. These were literally the titles of the, what you could get registered as from 1956 in, to 1969. So it was um, only an education requirement and an experience requirement in those early years. Um, and the other piece that is popping up now, and history repeats itself, is discussion about you have to have a master's degree to be certified. Well, that came from this historical document now because a master's degree was required to be a hospital recreation director at that time. Um, so when you hear discussion today, Oh, I think the minimal entry level should be masters. And why are we having that discussion, guys? Why, why are we as a profession having that discussion about, well, you know, need a master's degree to go practice. Why do you think we're having that? What have OT and PT gone to in speech? Masters. Masters. And some of them are even going directly to the doctorate without the masters, and they're advertising different schools. So the minimal entry level requirements by other professions are now, quote, being upgraded. Um, and so our folks that know this stuff and know the current situation say, hey, wait a minute, that's not a new concept. We, we required it initially. So we do need to go back and consider um, an entry level being more than a bachelor's degree. What, what do you think about that? Um, as you know, a direction. I mean, is that is that a direction you um, would advocate for the profession at this time in our development? No, I, I would, and and this is the reason why credentialing parallels the growth of your body of knowledge and the growth of your practice, what you do in, in the field. And right now our body of knowledge is not that differentiated between entry level information and graduate level information. You have to have enough um, research and good practice, best practice documents to, to support um, the offering of, of a higher level expectation. And I don't think we have enough Right. I think we're getting there. Um, and, it, and it's just like uh, I did this at ILRTA once. I brought in um, the textbooks that some of us had because we were kind of the second generation in our being educated. And we, we had four. <laughs> and that was through my doctorate. That was all we had. And at one point now, professionally, we've, we've even had four introductory books. So it does take time to generate the information and the practice and the research and the evidence that goes with the practice to have uh, an entry level piece enhanced. And mm -hmm. I, uh, right now, we're getting there, but, but I don't think we've got it yet. Yeah. I, I really don't. Um, hopefully we'll have more in the future, but I don't think we have it right now. I, so, I also feel like it might be a practical you know, in terms of the body of knowledge, that's you know that that's pretty, um, pretty clear that it's not there. In terms of the practicality of of a master's as an entry level as well, I don't know that we'd have the numbers to support it. No, we don't. I don't. I don't. I agree 100%. That would be my my concern. Yeah. You know, in addition to what you mentioned, mm -hmm. yeah. We definitely know, um, and, we, and we still have places where the master's degree is a first entry for a person because they've majored in something else. That was me, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think we'd be missing the boat if we departed or right. enhanced right. from that not having a foundation piece. Mm. So, so we have the Council on Advancement of Hospital Recreation, and they were the ones that started the registration process and pretty much stayed the same um, for a number of years. 
what happened then is that, um, and then again, this is before, after uh, it was even on, on the drawing board, um, the only organization that could could manage or take over registration was the National Therapeutic Recreation Society. Um, and so that's where a lot of us were committee members, and that's where I met Bob and some of the folks that uh, initiated this. So they had the NTRS registration board that uh, lasted until we created um, NCTRC. Um, and at the same time, after Bob walked in the door, we created the Continuing Professional Development Review Board because we said, okay, we, we agree. If, if we're going to go full force toward certification, and we were also looking at licensure at the time, it's very evident that you have to have an examination process. Um, so, and once you have that examination process, you have to stay updated. Um, and